We've been sharing stories this summer about strange and weird passages in the Bible, and today we hear yet another one. When you're taught how to preach, you are trained to exegete a scripture, to literally draw out and excavate the meaning of a passage by learning about its original context, learning about the word use. We often throw out words in Greek and Hebrew because that was a, the um, original language in which the Bible was written. We learn about the type of story or genre it is. Well, the opposite of exegete, you can guess, is eisegete. When you read into a passage your own opinion or point of view about Scripture. Sometimes we call that proof texting. You have an opinion, a viewpoint, and you want the Bible to back it up because that makes it so much a stronger argument. You want to find proof for it. So you find a text and you try and make that verse confirm your own conclusion. When we eisegete, we read into Scripture what we believe it says rather than exegeting and letting the Scripture lead us into the meaning. At times, it's hard not to eisegete and look for Scriptures that fit our viewpoint because we want to be right. But it's not a faithful way to read the Bible. That's why we have that prayer of illumination that Stephen offered. We have it each week, asking God's Spirit to illumine and guide us and show us the way. Today's strange story is one that has been misused, misinterpreted in harmful ways that I bet has influenced each one of us and the institutions around us, whether we knew it or not. But first, a story. It's about the Tuskegee Airmen, that elite group of African-American military pilots from World War II who defied the odds and expectations. They shot down 112 enemy aircraft in the air, even more on the ground. And they, as, as they escorted bombers in their combat missions. Perhaps you've heard about how courageous, how successful they were. The story I heard was about their trip on the way to their training in Tuskegee, Alabama. They were en route from various regions of the world, and they were going by tra train, and this was the 1940s. They were mixed up with all the other passengers who were traveling that day on the train until the train stopped in Washington, D.C., and there in the nation's capital, these elite recruits were ushered out of their cars and all moved and segregated the front two cars behind the hot engine. And on their cars read a sign that said, colored. The Tuskegee Airmen were an experiment to prove the assumption that Negro men, as they were called at that time, were not mentally capable of flying an airplane. The nation was desperately in need of good soldiers and airmen and had allowed this experiment to, of training this group of men separately in Tuskegee, Alabama, where a whole new airstrip was created just for them because they were not allowed to use the white military airbase that was close by. It was a given fact to many that those of African descent were a diminished race of people who just did not have the mental capacity to work alongside the more dominant culture. They were genetically predisposed to be servants. Many of them had, had, had been slaves. They were capable of physical labor. They did that well. And domestic service in the homes, but not much more. The Tuskegee Airmen Experiment was another attempt to prove this fact. Now, this view was not just a Southern attitude, although the Jim Crow laws of the South certainly made that viewpoint quite clear and legally binding. But this was a prevailing understanding across the country. And thus, this Tuskegee Airman opportunity gave the chance to conclude this for once and for all. It seems like ancient history, doesn't it? And yet, those who believed it believe they also had the Bible on their side. Isn't that hard to believe? They believed that God had ordained the separation and discrimination. This is the same Bible. We just heard that verse that Paul said in Christ, there's neither Jew nor Greek, male or female, slave or free. Yes, that same Bible. You see, we have that same temptation even now to take some weird Bible story and to twist its meaning to make it fit our own bias and prejudice and then elevate it that obscure Bible story is equal to all the other passages in Scripture, like commandments of Jesus, like proclamations of Paul. Today's story is that bizarre story of Noah and his sons. 
This is the main passage that Americans used to justify slavery. Yes, it was a common text for sermons in the past, reminding slave owners of their God-given place as owners of property, even if that property was a human being. And for the servants and slaves who might be attending the white churches in the balconies around, they, it was also a reminder, a reinforcement of their place as servants. Hard to believe. Maybe you've heard of this story uh, called the Curse of Ham, or maybe you haven't. Let's step, step back a moment and reflect on the context. Do a little exegesis ourselves on some of these ancient and strange stories. Many were written at different times and woven together, not just to convey the stories, but to give meaning to explain the places of names or events or rationale for ancient attitudes. Consider the story of Cain and Abel. Do you remember that one? It's another strange story of God's preference of Abel's offering of an animal sacrifice rather than Cain's offering of grain. One's a farmer, one's a herdsman. Now, does God have a preference over one over the other? Or is this explanation one to explain the ongoing feud between the nobads with their herds and those who had settled to raise grain? We also know when we talk about the flood story that many other cultures had, stu had stories of great floods and those who survived like the Mesopotamia story of Gilgamesh and the flood. In our Bible, we have two strands, two versions of this story of Noah and the flood. Maybe you've noticed that. At times, there's one story that talks about taking one pair of each animal on the ark. It's probably the one we know the best. But there's another account where Noah takes seven pairs of clean animals and two pairs of the unclean animals. They are in chapters 6 and 7. We've taken these two stories, we've edited and woven them together into one. You know, the story, the rains come down. It rains and rains and rains. The waters come up and up and up until the whole earth is covered and only the ark remains, Noah and his family and the animals. Noah sends a dove out. Finally, Noah sends a second dove, and it comes back with an olive branch of hope. Yes, land has returned. And the third dove is sent out, and it doesn't return because the waters have finally receded, and the dove has a place to nest. The ark unloads all those animals. Noah's family comes out, and they look up, and they marvel at the rainbow they see and the covenant God has made with them. End of story. That's where we usually end it with a delightful zoo full of animals and a covenant with a delightful rainbow. But the early of these biblical accounts continues on with this totally strange and weird story we heard today about Noah, the grower of grapes, the maker of wine, the first vintner. Since the whole world had been destroyed except for Noah's family, we are told that from his three sons, Ham and Shem and Jepheth, the whole world was now to be repopulated. Now that's a hint of the real meaning of this passage. Sometimes it's hard to see the real purpose because the biblical stories are used like myths to attempt to answer and explain questions and concerns that are no longer our questions or concerns. It becomes easier to take a weird story and twist and misinterpret scripture to explain what we want to, concerns we have in our own time. So, Noah's wine must have been pretty good. It's so strong, he ends up drunk, naked, and passed out after the first batch. Ham, his son, finds his dad as he lays uncovered in the tent. Ham goes and tells his brothers. Now Shem and Jepheth discreetly walk backwards. They put a blanket between them. They walk backwards to their father so they can't see him, and then they throw the blanket over it so now he is covered up. What has Ham done that's so wrong? What is his offense? Many see Ham as dishonoring and shaming his father by telling of the indiscretion. Whatever the crime, Noah wakes up and curses, not Ham. Did you notice that? The curse is for his son Canaan, who doesn't seem to be in the picture at all. In fact, the whole purpose of this odd story is about Canaan, not so much about Ham. You remember at the very beginning of this story, Canaan is identified as a son of Ham, one of the main actors in the story, although he's not even present there. So what in the world is going on? 
The name Canaan should ring some bells for us if we've read the Old Testament. Through the Old Testament, there's constant feuding and wars between the Israelites and the Canaanites. They're worshiping false gods. They're not being faithful. The Israelites are led into battle by Joshua and others to conquer the Canaanites and to claim the land of Canaan as their own. This story with the curse of Ham is really the curse of Canaan and those who will be his descendants. This story sets up the feuding that will take place between the Canaanites, descendants of Ham, and the Israelites, descendants of his brother Shem. Maybe you remember this odd passage that when Noah curses Ham, really Canaan, he declares the descendants of Shem, read Israelites, will enslave the Canaanites. Scholars believe this is the meaning, this is the purpose of this ancient and weird story. It gives the reasons for the conquering of the Canaanites and for the Israelites' constant battle. But do you know what we've done? We have centuries past, maybe even today, we have falsely used this story to battle other people. We falsely translate the name of Ham to mean dark. And the Bible tells us in 2 Chronicles that Ham's descendants will settle in southern Arabia, Egypt, northern Africa, and other places. Can you see where this racial misinterpretation is coming from? The word Ham could mean dark, his descendants traditionally could have been from portions of northern Africa. And since Ham's son Canaan is cursed to be a servant, and here's the giant leap if you're still with me, therefore God must ordain Africans, brown and black people, to be servants and slaves of all. Yes, that's a leap. But that's what was believed and preached and used for racist justification, for legal slavery, for Jim Crow laws, for believing that African Americans were designated by God to be inferior, to be servants. They're of low intellect, unable to be equal. They could only be servants and not worthy to ride in the same train car. They couldn't fly an airplane. They couldn't serve in the military along those of others who were white of the dominant culture. They couldn't marry whoever they fell in love with. They couldn't be elected to serve as leaders in Congress, president of the United States, or to be fully brothers and sisters of faith. The cause of this misinterpretation. Okay, you say, that's not my problem. <laughs> I'm not a racist. I have lots of varied friends. This is not my problem. This is old history. I'm off the hook with this one. This is not something I feel responsible for. And yet all around us, this interpretation has shaped our culture, shaped some of who we are, kept people of color in their place, helped us be so uncertain about the variety of privileges we didn't even know were privileges. We thought everybody had these things. Enough. Long overdue for those of us in Christian churches who have watched Scripture turn into weapons for our own causes. And that's easy to do. We want God to justify our actions. Now, this may not be the issue for us. We may be long away from it, but we still cherry-pick scriptures and listen to other people's interpretations that fit our bias instead of doing the hard work of learning about the context of stories in the Bible and with the help of the Holy Spirit in community to wrestle with those scriptures. This is what we do on Sunday mornings at a, at a Bible study or Thursdays. We wrestle with scripture. We look and we try to find out what the original meaning was and what God intends today. At times we mistakenly say all scripture is of equal value from prohibitions to tattoos or eating pork or women covering their heads in worship. They are not equal to commandments of loving the Lord our God with all our heart, our soul, our mind, and strength. And when we are honest, we really don't accept scriptures as all the same. Those of us who have body piercing and enjoy BLT sandwiches and fail to wear a hat in church if you're a woman. But we take these weird stories and wrongly elevate these ancient myths into equal importance as Paul proclaiming that we're all equal and loved in God's sight. So to claim we love Christ and love the Bible, we need to follow the basic and most important commandments. Even a, the teacher of the Jewish law asked Jesus, what is the most important commandment? 
They had so many. Which one is the most important scripture? And he says to love God and to love neighbor. To love all our neighbors equally and to ask for forgiveness when our institutions and human-made policies have failed and hurt and enslaved people. And then tragically cited scripture to do so. It's Labor Day coming up, a day to acknowledge that places and institutions and industries have not always been fair and helpful to people who have served and worked. We think about those who have worked in cotton and rice plantations, to those who even now harvest our fruits and vegetables, those who process the meat we eat, people who work in sweatshops so our clothing are so affordable, those in steel mills and textile mills, honorable factories, those who are working to make computer chips for everything we have. We need to continually look around and take our faith in God's justice for everyone. Whenever these children of God are being exploited, enslaved, and victimized. So when we come to this table, this is God's table. It's welcome for all, everyone, not just people who look like us, but all God's children in various shades and orientations, open from all the regions of the world, we all sit at this table and we serve the same Lord. Amen. I'm going to invite you to take a moment for some silent reflection, to ponder just for a moment what God may be telling you this day. Let us pray. Oh, Lord, help us listen to you through the words of Scripture, through the words of others, through the words of hymns. May we learn of your truth and of your hope. Amen.